Hello, welcome to my podcast, Conversations with David. I am your host, David Owasi. And on this podcast, we're talking to accomplished professionals and entrepreneurs across the country. We are learning about what keeps them passionate, what keeps them going. And we're also talking about some of the lessons and insights learned along the way. Now, I am here with my very good friend, Evgeny Gottfried. I've known him for some time now. Very, very excited to have him on the show. Uh, Evgeny, why don't you introduce yourself? Absolutely. Great to be here, David. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Evgeny. I'm currently a product manager at Bold Commerce, specifically working on a team called Kick Booster, uh, where we build solutions for the crowdfunding space. Uh, David, I've known you for, I don't know, how long is it now? Maybe seven years. Um, and in, in that entire journey, I've been uh, deep into, into business between running my own company and also along the way, learning as much as they can about uh, emotional intelligence, which I know is one of the big topics. And how to, uh, how to overcome challenges. So yeah, um, really, really excited to be here. I've heard a few of your other podcasts. I think you're doing a great job. So excited to, uh, to dive in. Excellent. Thank you, sir. And I'm super pumped about our conversation here. Now, uh, Evgeny, where I really want to get started is uh, your entrepreneurship journey. Uh, you and I really got to know each other uh, at the university, but from our business endeavors, running franchises in college room. And I always ask every entrepreneur I meet this, what was the reason why you had you had that itch? Why, you know, the big why for why you wanted to do entrepreneurship in the first place? What was that like for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I would say my entrepreneurship journey started a lot younger than when we met actually very early on. I believe I was about maybe 12 or 13 years old. Um, one of my friends and I, we, we couldn't get jobs anywhere else. Uh, we were too young for that. So we thought, well, let's just go knocking on some doors and offer people to cut their lawn or do some stuff around their yard and we'll do the work for free and they can pay us whatever they want. So the motivation there really was to make money and sooner rather than later we learned that we were actually making a killing because we would use people's own equipment to do stuff and we'd make like anywhere from 15 to 20 bucks an hour so that's when it really kicked off for me that i could own my own path i could make money my own way and um, when i furthered my education and i went through high school i had you know had thoughts of potentially going into dentistry and doing some of that other stuff but uh, ultimately ended up going to business school, came across uh, College Pro, which is actually where we met. And at that point, I think that a lot of what motivated me to run my own business and, and be an entrepreneur is actually the learning. It's the desire to stand out from the crowd, to do more than other students were doing at the time, and also to be able to make enough money to pay for school while I was going through all of that. So uh, definitely financial freedom is the initial piece that got me going. And then the learning is really what got me to stick. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, when I think about my own experience uh, back as well, I think one of the pieces was just being, um, being my own person, forging my own path and making my own way in this world. And uh, that was sort of my, you know, intrinsic mo uh, motivation to run a business. But when you started running your business, Evgeny, and I was there in your first year of, of business ownership, and it was quite the experience watching you uh, in that first year, I think it was my own second year of business when you were in your first year. What was that experience like for you in your first year of business and the reason why i'm asking you this question is that a lot of our listeners are probably thinking you know maybe i want to do this entrepreneurship thing and they're not sure what to expect in their first year what was that like for you i think it was one of the most humbling things that i've ever done it was something that i think ultimately forged me uh, the experience of, of what we were doing uh, had a lot of different challenges especially at the time i was i was 18 19 years old uh, every single penny that I had, I pretty much put on the line in order to make the business work. And uh, I thought it was going to be a little bit easier <laughs> than it turned out to be. But it was one of the most important decisions that I've made for my career because there were a lot of challenges and there were many moments that I experienced doubt, fear, all of the natural things that I think any entrepreneur goes through. And that experience gave me the confidence that I knew that I could do it because every single time that those obstacles would come, no matter how bad they hurt, no matter how terrible they felt, I was able to actually see it through. And I think at the end of that journey, of, at the end of that first year of running the business, I emerged a stronger person. And probably the most important thing that I gained is the ability to know that 
I can get through anything, no matter how hard it is. Absolutely. I think there is something very magical about overcoming difficult obstacles such that when you get to the other side of it, you feel that you can handle almost any other challenge once you've been able to go through some of those tougher moments. What would you say kept you going? Because in my first year, I remember there were a lot of times where I'm like, I'm done. This is not for me. I can't do this anymore. But somehow I always found that extra motivation to keep going. What would you say was that extra motivation for yourself to keep forging ahead, even regardless of all of the difficulties you just explained right now? I would say the biggest thing is just never giving myself the option to quit. Naturally, where I come from, I think I have a big advantage with my background of, of being an immigrant, you know, having gone through two immigrations, having watched my parents work really, really hard to get me to a place, to a country in the world where anyone can truly do anything. And for me, I just saw it as they did the hard work, they put in the legwork for me. I, you know, I, I, I get to enjoy the, the easy parts. So never even crossed my mind to, to stop or, or leave or to quit. It was more so just figuring out what is the next step and how do I figure it out? So there was definitely that aspect of just wanting to do service for what my parents did for me. And the other portion is I, need, I needed to pay for school. So I did not give myself the option to take time off of school in order to work. I wanted to make it all the way through. Mm. So I was very motivated by making sure that I can pay for my education at the end of the day. Absolutely. So it sounds to me like, you know, based on, on what you're saying, choosing to quit regardless is always a choice at some level. It's you making a decision and saying, I don't want to proceed. I don't want to move forward. And of course it helped that. Uh, and I share some of similar sort of uh, story to you with my immigrant background as well and having to pay my way through university. And that was the only option. I had no other option. Um, but for someone who say they don't have all of those um they're not preconditioned to make choices like that, where there's actually the option to quit and they will be fine if they quit. How would you say, how would you recommend or advise someone like that to approach the idea of quitting? So if things are, it's very easy to not quit when everything, you know, when you're not given the option to quit, right? Because you got bills to pay, you got things to do. But if you have all of those options to quit, and this could be in you know, entrepreneurship, it could be in anything else. What would you say, you know, should be going through your head in terms of how to not quit something that you're doing that you think is very hard and you're trying to quit just because of how hard it is. How would you approach that? Great question. I would say that, and, and it's a tough one. Mm -hmm. I want to be careful when I say this because I think at the end of the day, our actions shape who we are. You know, if you put optics away, if you put away how someone perceives us and how we look at the end of the day, it's what do we do when no one else is looking? And I think that when you have those thoughts and it's, it's okay to have those thoughts of, I want to stop, I want to quit. Maybe I, I want to be doing something easier. Those are very important pivotal moments where your character truly gets built because quitting is a decision and it's a slippery slope. The moment you quit, when is the next time that you're going to do the same action? So I would say that the most important thing is put all the optics away, forget what others think what do you want? And if quitting is truly the best decision for you and there's absolutely no other way, maybe that's the way to go. But just remember that at the end of the day, it's those actions that are going to ultimately sum up into who you are and where you stand. Yeah, I truly appreciate your, your response. That was well, well said and well put. At the end of the day, it's not about what other people think or what society think. You know, quitting sometimes is a strong, good decision to make sometimes. You know, it's not every time you have to like forge ahead, but ultimately it has to come down to what you truly want, what is truly important to you, not how uh, it looks to everyone else. So I truly appreciate your answer. Yeah. Now, uh, if I might add a little bit more to that, I, I think there's also just an aspect of seeing something through, you know, if we're talking about quitting in the perspective of transitioning from one career to the next, absolutely. Like there are, there are many times when quitting is actually like a strategy and a decision, but in this particular conversation, I was referring to it more as a function of you've made a commitment and along the way to see it through, do you quit? So I just want to want to clarify that that's what I'm talking about. Absolutely. And seeing things through is, is a habit. It's, it's something you learn to do, especially for myself. Uh, you know, some people have a natural tendency to be flaky uh, a little sometimes. And, you know, it's what it is. But uh, when you condition yourself where, you know, 
following through on your commitment, especially things you've committed to do. Uh, it's a habit that you can definitely build. And that's very important to, you know, being a, a successful entrepreneur or even being a, a successful career professional in any field, really. Following through on things is very important. So thanks for that insight. Now, uh, you've uh, definitely made a transition from uh, being a business owner uh, into uh, the corporate world. Uh, you work at Bold Commerce in, in the project manager, management space. Now, the question I have for you, Evgeny, is for someone who is making a transition from entrepreneurship, uh, so they run a business and they're trying to think, okay, I want to make an, and that move. Do I run another business? Do I go into corporate world? What was going through your mind while you were trying to make that decision and how did you decide to go to where you are right now? Mm -hmm. A lot went to that decision <laughs> and there was definitely that pivotal point of deciding which, which way I want to go. Uh, I, I would say for myself, it was highly learning driven. So you know, having been in the trades business in the past and having worked with entrepreneurs in that business, I always had an interest in technology and the world of technology is, is a very tricky one. And, you know, going off on your own and opening up uh, an app or a piece of technology, as you would know yourself through your experience with CapLock, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a big jump. So for myself, actually choosing to work at a company like Bold, first thing, it was, well, I really want to learn and I'm willing to work as hard as I need to and do whatever it takes to actually learn and understand the space and, you know, understand all of the, all of the pieces of the chessboard, if I, you know, if I may say so. But the other aspect of choosing where to go, I think has to do with the nature of the company. So, you know, you say corporate, a company like Bold is far from that. It's a, it's a rocket ship. It's always evolving. It's actually, it's, it's, there's such a strong entrepreneurial journey that even in my own project, I feel like an entrepreneur. And the term for that is intrapreneurship, mm -hmm. right? You don't always have to be the owner directly of the business that you're running. You could be the owner of an individual part of another business, which is what's been so exciting for me here. I feel like I'm running my own business, but of course I, I get to enjoy the access to all the resources that a big company like Bolt has. Mm, absolutely. And I, I do like the, the word entrepreneurship there. A lot of people think that for them to get experiences like the one you're referencing, which is owning your own project almost and making decisions on being independent in some fashion. A lot of people feel like you have to go out and do it yourself, but you're saying that you can actually if you find the right environment, you can actually do that. What would you say has been your biggest takeaway in the, I think is you've been there for almost a, two years now or a year and a half? Just over a year, so a Just year and a couple year. months. Yeah. Okay. What has been your biggest takeaway in this uh, very unique environment? You know, you you've been in. What has been your biggest learning so far? That's a that's a great question. Hard one to answer because there's been so much of it, but I would say it's just maybe maybe being humbled just by how how deep and complex and incredible the world of tech is that literally nothing nothing is impossible and mm. i've just thoroughly enjoyed working with a team of developers you know these individuals who are incredibly intelligent and and can turn ideas and concepts and requirements into tangible technology that you can actually see and click and press so when you say most takeaways that's definitely a big one is just getting fascinated by just how big and cool this world is. Uh, but the other one, I would say it's just understanding the dynamics of working with a product tech team versus working with a team of uh, other employees, for instance, like when in College Pro, we would have marketers and painters. It's just the different categories of individuals that you get to work with and understanding how to achieve the goal with them. For sure. And uh, in your role as a project manager, what does that really entail? What are you typically doing as a project manager? Mm -hmm. So starting as a project manager, initially, uh, I was in charge on, of two teams mm -hmm. and it was quite a, quite a vast and, uh, and broad role. So it ultimately just revolves around getting results and getting things done. So it's managing expectations, understanding where are we going? Are things moving on time? Uh, and just making sure that the general business health of the teams is good. And diving more into product over the past month, the, the focus is even, even more interesting because if you were to go and ask 10 different product managers what, 
product management is and what they do, you'll hear very different answers. Uh, so in my particular world with product, a big, the big learning for me recently has been understanding all the different processes and all the different strategies and tactics in order to go through a discovery process to understand how to build product strategy. And more than anything, it's just understanding the need of the space to determine what's next. So it's Absolutely. learning the space and ultimately organizing the whole team around it to be able to move in the right direction. Hmm. When I hear those, I, I, I hear some shades of basically being an entrepreneur. Uh, how would you say your career running a business and then you were the general manager and coaching other business owners? How would you say that experience really prepared you for this role you currently are in? And, and what, what, uh, what, uh, what, what, what would you say was the biggest contributor, contributor to your success in your current role right now? I would say just being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm. That's, that's a really big thing for me and something I focused a lot on in the last five to 10 years. Uh, again, it's that from that first year of running my own company and just knowing that I can take on anything and I, I know that if I put enough work, I'll be able to figure it out. I think that's been it because in the past year and a few months, I've, I've taken on different responsibilities, different roles and different items that I didn't initially necessarily know how to do, but I had the confidence to know and trust myself that I'll figure it out. And I have been able to. Mm. So one of those pieces I think is just that confidence and the willingness to take on more. Another piece is introspection, which is a topic I know you and I love to talk about uh, in our free time, uh, just the ability to self-diagnose and understand how I'm doing, understand where are my gaps and then taking those gaps and trying to cover them, which allows me to learn a bit faster. So I would say that's the second one. So kind of, first of all, being comfortable with being uncomfortable, introspection. And I would say the third contributor is just people skills, just the ability to lead a team. Um, there are many elements that transfer over regardless of what type of team you lead. So that's, that's been a huge help in my ability to keep learning and growing and evolve. Absolutely. And uh, I definitely appreciate the, those points you referenced, the idea of being comfortable with being uncomfortable, because uh, when you run a business, every day is different. New challenges are always coming up. And that definitely uh, throws you, life throws you a curveball every day, literally. And you have to just be comfortable with that. And when you go into a new role, it just feels very natural to handle all of those. I also like the fact that you mentioned uh, your second point, which is introspection. And we'll talk about that some more in the soft skills area. But uh, being able to understand what's going on with yourself and self-diagnose, uh, I think that's important. And of course, people skills. Now, when it comes to you know uh, some of those softer skills, uh, the emotional intelligence, the soft skills, introspection, can you just give me a general idea? And for, you know, for sake of our listeners, why would you say these skills are important to success, whether as an entrepreneur or whether as a, a career professional? Why are these are uh, very important? Sorry, uh, the internet got stuck for a second, but you're asking why are those skills important to success? Yes, correct. Yes. What as an entrepreneur and career professional? Yeah, I, I'd say those things are, are important to success because they're highly transferable. I mean, as an entrepreneur, there are so many different things that you could be doing, right? You could be in an agriculture business, you could be in the trades, you could be in tech, but there are going to be a lot of areas of overlap. And when it comes to soft skills, they're, they're highly transferable. Your ability to sell, you know, your ability to speak to others, your ability to empathize, your ability to resolve conflict. If you learn those skills in one business and then you want to go and run a business of a different sort, it, it all transfers over. And for an entrepreneur, I think that you naturally have to get good at those things. And if you don't, you're going to have a very hard time being an entrepreneur because your soft skills are ultimately the one of the most marketable things you have, at least to get started until you have people hired that perhaps have better skills than you in certain areas. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I definitely agree with you. And when I think about you know, soft skills, I, I, I think largely about emotional intelligence, and that is uh, something you and I have had a lot of conversations about. But when I think about emotional intelligence and soft skills, I think of uh, three, three 
big you know blanket so i think of um self-awareness and you know that kind of links to the idea of introspection we we're talking about earlier self-awareness is all about you know understanding what's going on with you understanding why you're feeling what you're feeling and you know that ties into introspection which is when you're faced with an issue trying to just kind of take a pause and understand what's going on and then making conscious decision on how to approach uh, whatever issue it is you're facing how would you say someone who is struggling in that skill how would you say they should have approach growing that skill and how have you grown uh, that skill over your years uh, you know in entrepreneurship and now uh, in uh, at board commerce mm -hmm. so how have i grown that particular category of self-awareness uh, yes. in my in my career mm -hmm. yeah that's a great question uh, this one this one is probably one of the most uncomfortable things to develop if you're not initially good at it because mm -hmm. it's a little awkward and what i mean by that is it requires looking in the mirror and not literally necessarily, but it's actually engaging with your own mind. And one of the tactics that I, I'm a big, big advocate for is journaling. And I, I talk about it in one of my, my blog posts, but I think that a good starting point as an individual who wants to get better at being self-aware, start journaling, start writing down your thoughts because that is going to be your first indicator of how you sound in your own head. Mm. And journaling is a skill on its own. And one of the biggest challenges I had initially is I tried to make it a task. I tried to journal every single day. That didn't work for me because it felt like a chore. So that had to evolve into a more organic activity. So when I felt like journaling, like if I felt like I have something to talk about, I have something I want to vent about and I'm thinking and my gears are moving in my head is, when I pull out my journal, I write down what's in my mind. And that allows you to actually see how your mind thinks and start catching the different types of thoughts. And then from there, once you have that basic sense of awareness is when you can start building on top of it. Absolutely. I do agree with you. Journaling has been also a huge crucial piece of my growth and awareness. And that thing I will add to that also in terms of awareness is being able to ask people for feedback. And I think, um, you know, on one of our collaborations, on one of our posts, we had this uh, exercise where you basically had you know, a couple of your friends, have them uh, give you some, uh, so if you're trying to find out your awareness on a specific skill or how good you are, have them to have them rank you. And then you can then take the average of the scores to really get a sense. But even beyond that, just getting feedback generally. And that's something that has been huge for me because you think that you're very good at a specific skill or you, you, you think the world sees you in a certain way and then when you really go ask for feedback you find out that you know you're not up to scratch or your ideas in your head of who you are or how you are at something is very very different from how other people sees you and then that can help you take steps now can you talk to me more about the humility in awareness in the journey of awareness because you know to 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 really look at yourself in the mirror and to ask yourself the tough questions is a really difficult process, especially if you know you're not uh, humble enough to acknowledge the fact that you know you're not good at everything. There are areas of strength or weaknesses. Can you just talk to me how you approach that humility and being able to know that you're not great at everything and just being humble about that? Mm -hmm. Well, that that's an interesting one because I, I think humility is a good way to segue kind of into, into that. Some people, you know, may claim that they want to get better at self-awareness, but they don't really, because they don't really want to hear the feedback. Right. So I think where humility comes in is, is the ability to accept the fact that you have stuff to work on. Everyone does. Like every person has stuff they need to work on. And whenever you do ask for feedback or whenever you do pursue any form of journey to get better at all of this stuff is having the genuine desire to improve, right? So when we talk about approaching humility, I think it's just framing our own mind with the fact that the reason we're asking for feedback, the reason why we want to hear the stuff that we may not necessarily want to hear is the big picture that we want to become better. And I think this is especially important when it comes to approaching people for feedback. You can lose a lot of trust if you approach people genuinely asking them, oh, I really, I really want your feedback and I want to improve. And, and they go vulnerable with you and they tell you the stuff and then suddenly you get upset or you, know, you start treating them a bit differently. Like you can't do that kind of stuff. You, you have to truly be ready and accept it, be thankful and 
those sort of relationships, I think, will will continue paying their dividends in terms of helping you get better. I definitely agree with you, Evgeny. And I learned this lesson you know, very, very hard uh, in my early years as, a, as an entrepreneur. I you know I had all this thinking about myself. You know, I'm great at sales or you know, I'm great at, uh, great at training my employees or hiring and whatnot. And then I had someone external come into my business and they just told me, hey, David, nope, you're not good at it. So you got to do X, Y, Z. And I had two decisions, like you mentioned, reference. I could be mad. I could throw a fit. I could just say, no, no, no. And I'm good at everything. I could be like, you know what? Tell me more about that. How can I grow? How can I improve? And fortunately for me, I chose the other approach of learning and just being humble. And I think it's very important for our listeners, even myself, yourself, to understand that it's okay not to be perfect. It's fine. It's very natural to not be good at something or to be lacking in in different areas. And the whole point of humanity, uh, the human experience, if you will, is walking towards improving and getting better. And now, Evgeny, uh, the second thing that when I think about emotional intelligence is I think about uh, regulation, right? Self-regulation. Uh, so it's one thing to understand what you're feeling and why you're feeling. It's one thing to get those feedback and you know, know areas you have to improve on. It's a whole completely different ball game to manage and put uh, some of those volatile emotions under control when you no know, needs be. How would you say you've grown in this skill over the years? What has contributed to your growth? And how would you advise someone who is struggling with keeping themselves in check, you know, during when things are stressful or during high pressure situations? And, you know, I have worked with you personally over the years and I've seen you really grow in that skill and being, uh, regulate, being able to regulate yourself. What has been the secret for your growth in this specific skill? There's a few things. Uh, one, for a while, I, I really got into Stoic philosophy. So listening to a whole bunch of different Ryan Holiday stuff and trying to uh, emulate that as much as I can. And obviously the whole idea of Stoic philosophy is focusing on on things that you can control and understanding that you need to be as, as cool-headed as possible in any given situation to reach the best possible outcome. So there's definitely been diving a bit more into that whole philosophy and just educating myself on what's, what's possible and equipping myself with those tools. And besides that, I think just being very aware in in any given conversation and being prepared. So if I'm going into a situation that I know is going to be uncomfortable and that can range in different things as an entrepreneur, whether you're about to engage in a conflict with a customer, a conflict with an employee, or you know that something didn't go great and you're going to be getting some hard feedback, I think it's taking the time to frame your mind around, okay, this is going to suck or this is going to be a bit more difficult. And being very well aware of what is your final outcome in a given situation. So in a scenario that you're having conflict and you may be prone as an individual to maybe heat up or, you know, really, really grow hot headed. It's understanding before you go into that conversation, what am I trying to get to? And if your answer is, I, I want to make things proper and I want to solve this conflict, then as you enter it, it's important to communicate it from the beginning and understand that that conversation is no longer about you. Because if you're interested to achieve a resolution, that requires collaboration with the other person. So in conflict situations, the type of thing I've tried to do for myself is just frame it. Okay, I'm here in order to solve the problem and I'm going to be on my best behavior and I'm here for the other person. I'm no longer here just for myself. And in a situation, if you, if you know that you don't care to solve the conflict or you don't want to solve the conflict, uh, I think it's just being clear about that and not entering it in the first place because productive conflict is a tool. So that's just one piece of it. Other, other things like, I don't know, I, I, get, I get nervous sometimes before doing any form of public speaking. Like I, I find that my heart starts racing, right? And you, know, you start, start getting anxious. And then when I start talking, I'm usually fine. But something I had to actually learn in the process to to be a better speaker is self-talk, such as, you know, being recognizing the fact that, okay, my body is reacting right now in a fight or flight response, but there's no fighting or flighting to be done here. You know, it's just, it's just people in front of me. So taking some deep breaths, doing breathing exercises, understanding that, you know, everything's fine and then entering the situation. So 
you know, ranging from conflict to just purely preparing my physiological self for a situation that may may, make me a bit more anxious has been really helpful. It's finding those kind of exercises and tools. Absolutely. I do agree with you. You and I share so many philosophies together from stoicism to uh, many, uh, many things. But I do appreciate two things uh, from from your response. And the first one is, you know, regulation is not really about, you know, it's, regulation is all about making sure that whatever actions you are in a specific moment is consistent with your long-term goals. So, you know, in the moment, if you're trying to resolve conflict, like the example you gave, it's very easy to flare up when you know, someone says something offensive or whatever. And, you know, if you respond to that, then you're not really identifying with your goal, which is to resolve the conflict. So making sure that your actions, regardless of whatever garbage is going on around, is making sure it's reflecting with that specific goal you have in mind. And um, I think the second thing is, of self-talk is really, really important as well, because this is an area that I have also really, really grown in, in myself, is when you're in a specific situation and there's pressure, whether that's you know, due to any number of reasons, just talking to yourself and saying, okay, it's normal to feel this way right now. That is okay. Nothing is wrong about this feeling of frustration or anger or rage or whatever it is. But this is how we want to proceed with this. I can go vent on my uh, on this later on. I can go to the gym and walk it off or whatever it is I want to do to you know, walk it off. But for now, talking to yourself and making sure that you understand what the stakes are, I think that's very, very important. So thanks for, for, for that insight, Evgen. For sure. And, and if I can add another point to that, I think a big part of regulation to build, build on top of this whole uh, self-talk aspect is negative feelings hate attention. So another thing that I find very powerful is if you ever feel crappy, if you actually just take a moment and you actually just accept and re recognize the fact that I'm feeling crappy right now, that alone helps so much with digesting the emotion. Or if you're feeling angry or you're feeling really, really stressed, you know, you have a busy day at work and then there's stuff happening outside of work that's sucking up your energy and you're feeling really overwhelmed. It helps so much just going, I'm overwhelmed right now. Okay. All right. I'm overwhelmed. Cool. Move on with it. Right. Like it's fine. Every day, like tomorrow's another day. Yeah, definitely. I agree. And it's definitely, I think that the root of, of that point is that there's nothing wrong or inherently bad about even negative emotions, right? They're just emotions. And it's funny because my wife and I, you know, being locked up in this pandemic together, we, we go through that cycle where someone is feeling grumpy. And fortunately for <laughs> us, we've, we've kind of grown in a relationship where we're able to have almost that self-talk to each other. We are, you know, I'm feeling grumpy or she's feeling grumpy. I'm like, you're grumpy right now. And then <laughs> instead of someone, the other person being defensive, even like I'm not grumpy they're like oh yeah I'm grumpy and then we both start thinking okay so why are we grumpy right now <laughs> <laughs> and then that becomes a very fascinating conversation because oh because you no know, xyz happened or you know uh, I have all this work done or I, I feel the pressure and then we're able to resolve the situation and move forward but I feel like if you choose to ignore the feeling I don't acknowledge it like you said then it's just it's just lingering there and then it just becomes worse and worse and i think uh, that's definitely something now the last thing I, I wanted us to talk about on the emotional intelligence front is the idea of empathy right so you know empathy is all about putting yourself in the shoes of other people and that, and this really is the key to building strong relationships and uh, really um you know winning people over if you will to your cause um what would you say how would you say you've grown in this skill and what's your recommendation for someone who's trying to improve this uh this skill I think all of us have an inherent level of empathy. So some of us are naturally a bit more attuned to it than, than others. Uh, I found for myself, I've, I've always really, really cared about people and I've always found it important to put others uh, ahead of myself. So for myself, I wouldn't say it was a massive ramp up, uh, but it's certainly something that I've, I have worked on and I have refined and I think it's a very, very powerful internal tool. Um, for empathy, the very basis of that whole train of thought is that it's not about you. It's about the person in front of you. So when it comes to working productively with someone, and like you said, maybe getting someone to join your cause, if you want someone to join your cause, the way you need to talk to that person and the way you need to interact with that person is first understanding what do they need? What is their cause? What, what are they trying to do? And once you 
can understand that piece of information, that is when you can either show them how what you're trying to do aligns with that, and then you reach alignment and you're able to sell. And that's empathy is uh, the, the absolute core of sales. Um, and if it doesn't line up, then you can make the best possible thing is to ad admit that there's misalignment and maybe there's, there's no mutual pursuit. Uh, so in a business sense, I think when it comes to empathy, if someone wants to work on it, I think it's a matter of growing to be a better listener. And that means taking pauses. It's, and that's something I really had to work on. I'm a very, very extroverted, chatty person. Uh, and even in this podcast, you, you know, when I go, it's, a, da, 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 da. it's important to be able to actually pause, give the other person a chance to talk, ask them if they have any questions, invite their perspective. Otherwise, it's just a one-way conversation. So number one, I would say, if you want to get better at empathy is take the time to actually listen to the person in front of you. That's, that's number one. And that really had to learn. And, you know, this is actually something I learned in college pro. My, uh, we used to track our sales success rate, right? And one of the biggest things I had to do to jump about 10 or 15% was to actually understand what the customer wanted and explain how I fit those needs as opposed to using every tool in the book to try and sell to them and hope one of them lands. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I definitely, uh, listening has always been something I struggle with as well uh, as uh, an extroverted person who had a lot of ideas and things I wanted to talk about, but I have learned sometimes less is more and just listening and being quiet is more important. And that thing also, I think Maya Angelou said this, uh, you know, people after leaving you, people don't necessarily will remember whatever you said or how that interaction went. What they often remember is how they felt in that interaction. And I think that, you know, empathy really helps you to make sure that whatever it is you're saying or you're doing, your action is consistent with how you want them to feel after that interaction is over. Because I don't know how, if you felt this before, but sometimes, you know, you remember someone or you remember an interaction with someone and you just feel good about that person. Like you feel good about that interaction. And you don't even know why, but you just feel positive feelings. And that is what empathy does. It, it helps you, you know, feel better. Uh, it helps make people who have interacted with you feel better after they left you. And sometimes it's very difficult to do, but again, it's just like, a, it's a skill to, to, to be mastered. Um, so thanks for all your insight on, uh, on emotional intelligence. The next now in the transition I'm competition into is something that I think is very important to you and probably even more important in today's world, the idea of minimalism uh, and the idea of consumerism. Can you just share with me why these you know, ideas have been in your mind recently and why it's important for us to think about them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, something I've been thinking a lot about, and it, it's not necessarily just, just triggered by the, the whole pandemic, but I, I've tried to do a little, more, a little bit more soul searching with myself and really try and understand what's important to me. And when I really dive deep into the things that matter at the end of the day, I find that a lot of those things are not things that you can buy. They're not things that you can purchase. And there's definitely an aspect of having financial freedom and having a certain level of material wealth. But it's something I've been exploring a lot is just the trained behavior that we actually have to consume. And I'm currently working on, on you know, I mentioned to you earlier, I'm working on a, actually a blog right now that explores that whole thought. We are born to be consumers. A baby is born from age one. What does it get on its birthday? It gets, it gets presents, right? And as we go through our entire life, we seem to have this entrenched desire to buy more and consume. Why do you want to raise in your job? Well, so you can make more money so that you can you know, go and buy that car or whatever. So I, I think that a lot of us, uh, especially people who are really ambitious, tend to have misdirected ambition. A lot of people tend to overemphasize and focus on the material wealth that they get out of things, which is a learned behavior of consumerism. And what I'm trying to learn more about and, and talk more about is the fact that I think that that's actually misdirected ambition. You don't actually need as much as you think you do in order to be happy. And for me, I think that this actually happened largely in my time in, in college pro as an entrepreneur. 
there was a certain amount of money that beyond which, you know, as soon as you start making it, you've bought all your toys, you've bought all the things you wanted to, that you don't really know what to do with. Mm. It just gets stuck away. So for me, I've learned that I don't actually need that much to be happy. And what I want to encourage people to do is to actually spend time thinking through what's important to them at the minimum, what do you actually need? And then reassess whether how you're living today is working towards that. Mm. And, you know, if you're, if you're currently making X salary, right. And that X salary allows you to do the things that are important to you, but somewhere in the back of your head, you're working towards going to Y salary, but that jump means that now you're going to have way less time to actually spend with your life, with your loved ones, pursuing your hobbies, pursuing the other things that make you flourish. Is that really worth the trade-off? And I think a lot of people pull the trigger without thinking about it. Mm. So that's, that's an aspect of it. And I can dive a bit deeper, but the overarching thought is we, we don't actually need as much as we may inherently think we do. Absolutely. And, you know, I was actually reading an article quite recently on, on this subject of, uh, of consumerism and, and the insight that I was gleaning from that, from that article was, was the fact that a lot of people associate, you know, material wealth and uh, accumulating of physical stuff to their level of self-importance or their level of who they are. They associate their wealth to their self-image, their self-projection, who they are. And I think those are very, very dangerous associations to be made because honestly, regardless of how wealthy you are, maybe except if you're Jeff, Jeff Bezos, <laughs> there's someone else out there who has more than you. And it's a, it's a losing battle really if you keep wanting to accumulate stuff. So how do you balance the approach of, you know, being successful because there is a healthy amount of drive you know that you know every normal every person should have you, know, you want to be successful you want to have a comfortable life how do you approach you know balancing that healthy drive to you know making sure that you're not being driven for the whole sake of accumulating stuff how do you approach both of those angles in your head mm -hmm. one of them is practicing gratitude it's actually just taking time to recognize the things that I'm grateful for. Mm. And I, I call this the reallocation of value, right? It's instead of being so fixated on what am I working towards and putting all, all my focus on that, it's actually taking a bit of that focus back and saying, well, here's, here's how far I've come along so far. Here are all the amazing things that I have. And that helps tip the scales a little bit in terms of feeling, feeling happier. So that's one of them is just recognizing the things I already have. Mm. Uh, another one of the pieces of actually balancing success and uh, what I'll call holistic wealth and the absence of, of consumerism is, is just being clear on, on your goals. Mm. What are you working towards? Like, what do you need the money for? Like a, an exercise I would encourage anyone to do is sit down right now and write down you've been given a hundred thousand dollars today. What, 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 where is every single dollar of that going to go? And you might find that after about five lines on your paper, you don't really know what else to do with it. Right? So what are those things that you actually care about? How much are they worth? What can you do to achieve them? Hmm. So I you may realize that you may not need as much as you think you do. Yeah, I think it all again boils down to the idea of self awareness because it takes a level of awareness to really even be in that mind space to think about okay, so I'm pursuing this wealth. Okay, why? So what's what's why is it important? Is it because of my self image? Is it because uh, I actually have specific things I want to use that money for, or is mm -hmm. it because I just want to brag and be able to say, hey, I made a hundred grand, you know, this last month or whatever it is? Yeah. And I think self awareness is really key in that equation too. Yeah, and I mean just an example. And, and this one, I, I've been entertaining this thought for a while. Let's say, I don't know, I, I like cars, mm. right? And I, you know, I have, I have a car I'm happy with. And I oftentimes find these ideas of, oh, maybe, maybe I should get that one. And every single time I feel really fixated on an upgrade from my car, whatever the gap is in that material wealth, let's mm. say the car is going to be an extra $40,000. I feel like, I'm $40,000 poorer because now I, you know, I need to figure out this money or I need to take financing, whatever. And 
if I really break it down, like, do I really, really need that car? Will it, will it actually make me that happy? Like, where else could I spend those funds? If I can train myself to realize that I don't actually need that, I just became holistically $40,000 wealthier because mm. it's money I no longer need. Absolutely. So look, a little mind, mind switch there on, on wealth. And uh, if you're not spending, you're saving that money almost in a, in a certain way. Yeah. And hey, you know what? It, there's nothing wrong with pursuing material wealth. And if that, if that vehicle will make you really happy, and I'm just using that as an example, mm. then that's great. And that's very worthwhile. And that's worth working towards. But I think just oftentimes we, we pursue things because we like the idea we have the added noise of social media, which I think makes it a lot harder uh, for an average person to be happy with themselves than a thousand years ago when you just lived in your own little circle. Sure. Uh, so there's a lot of noise that competes and a lot of marketing that happens that consistently encourages you to buy more. Here's the mm. next best thing. You need this, you need that. I no, don't, you know, filter yeah. the noise. Absolutely. And, you know, we've not even gone into the whole idea of, you know, pollution and, and uh, global warming and, and uh, plastics and how it's bad for environment. And that's a whole topic for another day. But I, I think just for our mental health, the idea of really understanding why we want something and being intentional about that thought, I think, if anything, that will help us be even more healthier, more happy, more content with what we have and not look at, you know, the neighbor down the street or your friend uh, who seem to have the coolest stuff, but you don't even know what's going on in their lives. And uh, it's just an appearance. Now, Evgeny, those are amazing things to talk about. The last thing I wanted us to talk about as our uh, time winds down there, it's been a fascinating conversation so far, <laughs> is the idea of, you know, the fact that we're in a pandemic. And um, I'm very curious for yourself, personally and professionally, before we started recording this conversation, you were just kind of finishing work, which was like pretty late. <laughs> but uh, how would you say the pandemic, you know, has uh, affected uh, you personally and professionally and how you adapt into it? Mm -hmm. Professionally, um, it, it hasn't impacted me too much, fortunately. Uh, we're, we're in the business of building e-commerce software. So... As, uh, as you may imagine, that entire world has only grown more significant with the pandemic. So we've been really busy. Uh, the biggest change is just transferring from an in-office environment to a remote environment. And I think we've been able to transition quite smoothly. And um, I get to connect with my team over Hangouts and Zoom. So professionally, there hasn't been too much of a change as much as I do enjoy the energy of uh, everyone that I typically have gotten to work with. Uh, personally, uh, I'd say that one of the things that have been, has been tougher is not being able to to go to the gym. So I had definitely had to get a little bit more creative on how to stay active. And uh, something that's been really helping is just doing daily walks, uh, especially with, I mean, right now it's, it's dark so early, right? 5 p.m. the sun is set. Mm. Uh, it's trying to be as intentional as possible to even take a half hour walk break at four while the sun is still out and get the body moving has been fantastic. And um Playing, playing some online games with friends, just finding other ways to connect. And um, and I also got myself a Kindle, which has been awesome. I've been doing a lot of reading. <laughs> so just, just things like that. Uh, yeah. So in terms of productivity, a lot of people has, have struggled with keeping their levels of productivity up. Just number one, because there is, you no know, you're just at home and you know, it's hard when there's no other people around you to motivate you or the, or the clear distinction of being at work and then being at home. Mm. How would you advise someone who is struggling with productivity to manage that and, and get themselves up and moving and get things done? I would say, it's, first of all, be realistic with your attention span. So if you're an individual with a naturally shorter attention span and you need a break every half hour, take a five minute break after every half hour of work, check your phone, you know, stand up, stretch, do whatever it is that you need to do. Um, one of the, I, I had to work remotely for about three years prior to the pandemic. So that's uh, no stranger to this. And I find that for myself, you know, unless I'm in back-to-back -back meetings or I have a, a schedule that just really drives me, um, my attention span usually caps out at about an hour. So at the end of an hour, I take a five minute break. I do what I need to do and, and then back to work. So I think having those micro breaks is really helpful with productivity and is, is quite healthy. And I think it's just having clarity around what is your day's outcome. 
what are the two or three biggest things you need to achieve today? Figure that out first thing in the morning before you get it started or anything else. And that's your focus. And you know that at the end of the day, if you go back to those main items, if you didn't achieve them, you failed your day, get back to work. If you did it, then good job. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think for myself, what I what helps me get through my day and have my productivity up is block scheduling. So, you know, at the, at the, usually the night before, at the beginning of, of, of the day, I just put in my schedule. These are the things I need to do today. Now, it doesn't mean I follow them to the later and do everything exactly as planned, but I make sure, but just like you said, having those two or three uh, takeaways of what needs to happen that day uh, gives me more clarity on how to define whether my day was a success or not. So I think that's important. Now, Evgeny, uh, last question I do have for you here is a bit of a tricky one. It's more about predictions. And uh, I ask all of my guests on the show just because I'm always curious as to, you know, what you think will change as a result of the pandemic. The pandemic is affecting everybody and for better or for worse, and there's no wrong or right answers to these, some things will be bound to happen over the next couple of years. What, in your opinion, would you think will be changing as a result of the pandemic? I, I expect consumer behavior is going to be very different we're going to see a lot more innovation in this space of e-commerce. Um, we are going to grow to be a lot more delivery based for a lot of how we buy. Mm. So I, I would say that's probably one of the biggest things is just how people consume goods. And it still blows my mind that with things like Amazon prime, even during a time like this, you can get, you can click a button and two days later, you have the item at your door, you know, skip the dishes. You can, you fill out a quick form and then 30 minutes later you have the food and this is expanding you know we have companies like good local in winnipeg mm. who's empowering smaller boutiques to be able to do that um so I, I think we're going to see a lot more of that type of model and i also expect that certain technologies such as google hangouts and zoom and collaborative uh technologies that allow people to work remotely are going to grow because I think companies are actually going to be a lot more open and a lot more inclined to grow remotely. I think mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see a lot less brick and mortar style offices and more companies will emerge as remote companies because look, we're what eight months in mm -hmm. and a lot of companies are doing great. So Absolutely. Thanks for all of the insight there. Yeah, it's been such a massive pleasure, Evgeny, having you on the show. I've really enjoyed our conversations as usual, and uh, we've shared lots of insights. So thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thank you, David.